FX, and then hold on, FPRE, AI Workshop 9, perfect. So we're not driving our own slides. So you will drive your own slides. What's going to happen is, is I'm going to load the application and then you can drive them. So the way it's going to work is I can pass the ball to you guys. Um, I'll show how it works. Okay. So I'm not sharing my screen. In other words, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Basically what you're going to do is when we, we come to talk to, uh, you know, for your particular one. So here's yours. You basically click the screen once where the presentation is. Don't double click because then it'll show a little tag and say Tim Lewin clicked here. But if you click once and then to the left hand side of your screen, you should have a little like semi transparent. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it action bar that has a number in the middle and then arrows. If you click those, you sh so well, hold on. So if I make you presenter. You then become the presenter and now you should be able you click that middle of the screen and then you should be able to advance the slides and go backwards with that little bar to the left hand side. I think you can also do page up page down. Let's see. I lost. The slides, I don't see them anymore. I just see all of you. That's weird. I basically said it. So I load, I shared a file. It said you are now the presenter, so it's going to let me share. It looks like. I can see your slides, <laughs> Tim. Oh, you can see them? Uh, That's good. Well, overview of turbine logic. Yeah, yeah. as soon as yep. you hit, hit that button, I lost the slides and I only see all of you. Oh. That, that's interesting. Well, here, let me see if I can. You can you mind. give, yeah, can you give me back um, presenter privileges? Basically go to my face, right click it and go make presenter. Okay, if I right click your face, <laughs> I get. Damn it, WebEx! Uh, <laughs> just all these other options. Well, hold on. Yeah, well, let's see if I can. I, I, I can move to stage or I can chat. Huh. Oh, show my. Say, how do I get my presenter privileges back here? Move to stage, share self and floating window, mirror my video. I don't even have the opportunity. I made him presenter and now it's all over. Move to stage or show myself in a floating window. Oh, now I see that. Hold on one sec. I just saw that. What'd you just do? Did you just grab it back? I haven't done anything. Someone gave it to me. So can you see your, your slides now? Now I just saw them. Something just happened so I can see them. Yeah. Who did something? Right. <laughs> yeah. So I went ahead and forced the uh, presenter back over to you, Stephen. Uh, okay. Are you going? So here's the question then. While we're moving, so what what we're going to do is it's going to be. Uh, I can talk if I toggle through the files on my machine, and then give someone else presenter privileges. Is that going to allow this to? share from my screen but they have driving rights why don't you try uh, someone I else i had to use the the um i my app didn't work so i had to go to the uh, i had to just log in for it so see if okay. someone else can do it. i wonder if this is a a functionality thing with the if you're, if you're not using your desktop app so i'm gonna put kelly's slides up and then make her presenter and you should be able to single click on the slide and then use that bar to the left to advance. With those little arrows above and below. I don't see arrows. Do you ha do you have that little like task bar slide that has like a squiggly line, four squares, a yeah. number? Oh, there do it is. I see it. Yeah. There okay. we go. Yes. Yes, we have it. it. So, yeah. and, and then basically we're going to go through alphabetical order. So, I mean, from here, since I made her presenter, you now have presenter rights. So you kind of have to do the, the presenter ball pass. So from here, we'd be going to Chet. So at the middle of the screen, there is the opportunity to toggle through the presentations. Or you can just pass it back to me. I mean, that's fine, too. Yeah, how do you pass the ball back? Should be able to right click on the next person's face in the video and say make presenter because I think all of us are co-hosts at this point. 
Yeah, that's what I did. I just I signed presenter rights to Chet and Steve. If you can launch the presentation, I, I wasn't sure. Okay. How to do that. If I can do that, and and Rick, yours is still loading. I don't know if that's uh. I'm I'm okay. moving now uh, Kelly's presentation. Okay, so at the top of the screen, you see where it says viewing AI work. It's like right below. Uh, if you have the the pictures going across the top, right below that, there's something that says viewing AI Epri AI work. You should be able to click on that arrow and actually select your presentation. If you can't do that, maybe the idea is to to pass it back to me while we're going through bios and stuff like that, and then I can toggle the presentation and then pass the ball to the next presenter. Does that make sense? Are you telling me, Steve, or who are you talking to? Yeah, the only so, one I have uh, to write to is the is is my presentation, Steve. So the rest of them are grayed out. Okay. So um Chet, can yeah, can you pass privileges back to me? Because that's probably what we're gonna have to do. Yeah, I again. I, I did just now. Perfect. So then basically what's gonna go on is I can go in and change the presenter. Does the animation work here if we do this? Uh, just each of, and just each of us sharing our own presentations from our desktop when it's our turn. So we can. That's fine. I thought this was going to be easier, but apparently it's not. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Okay. If, By the way, it might just be me because because I've I had to log in as a guest via the the thing. So it may just I'll just I'll just let you drive my slides. Okay. I can do that. Yeah, I was going to say from here, I thought it'd be easier from, from this way, but if you just want to do it from and your, your desktop and you're on hot standby, that's fine as well. So like Dave Miller, do you have the button at the bottom that says share content? Like if, if I in do. a pinch, yeah. So if in a pinch for some reason, Steve at all, the, the Steve, you driving the PowerPoints doesn't work. It seems like each panelist here has the ability to just launch their screen. And that's that's totally fine. Once again, they, they I mean, this is set up in multiple different ways from, I just got done with um, my advisory session and it was more like the way I was trying to do it. But again, just it depends on how it's set up. But yeah, I mean, like I said, Chet, I can do that for you. And then you should be able to drive it, which you can. And then once again, we can, yeah, so you can privileges. give it. Yeah, you can give it to me, and I'll give it back to you. So I, I'm going to give it back to you. Okay. I just give it back to you. Okay, and basically the way we're going to do it is we're going to alternate uh, talking each person up. So I'm going to introduce Kelly, then Kelly's going to introduce Chet, then I'm going to introduce. I'm trying to remember the alphabetical order. Rick, and then and then Kelly's going to introduce Dave or Tim. Tim. Then I'm going to introduce David, and then she's going to introduce Dawn, and then we're going to go about our business on the chat and the open discussion. But once and again, I'll go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Steve, rather than me sharing my screen, I'll just have you, if you can just click my slides for me, I'll just say yeah. next slide. Okay. That's to right. totally Thanks. fine. Yep. Yep. Or whoever's. Yep. I'll be driving. <laughs> like I said, if if worse comes to worse, and and we we need to just right click on my name and 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 give me back uh, presenter privileges and and I can be the MC no problem. Hey Steve, uh, since the animation here is not working, you can drive my slides also. Okay, I can do that. So should should we be inviting people? I was going to say there's people that are are people already joining the. Uh, the call in here because I think we're supposed to have this as like a breakout session. Um, we're we're offline until five forty. That's what I thought. Because yeah, a few people are coming oh, sorry, in. I'm seeing three forty. <laughs> yeah. Time zones. I got got Leah and Matt. But yeah, let's see. I'm I'm going to see if you're. Stuff is like so. Yeah, Rick, I'm not sure yours is loading in PDF. If you're able to send me a PowerPoint, that'd be great. Or once again, I can just give it to you, and you can drive it from your desktop. That's fine as well.
Hey, Leah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd like to say that. I think they were supposed to have like a kickoff for this prior to and then go into a breakout session. Details, details. Hey, exactly. Hey, Steve. Yes. There we oh, go. Can you, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, for some reason, let me see if that's the video interference. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. For a while there, I had to reboot my microphone for some reason. Okay. Okay. I yeah, just I, I, updated I, PowerPoint. I did. I did perfect. Not updated, but the actual PowerPoint. Can okay. You let's see if that'll. Can we load in? Just to make sure I can drive to. Sure. Like I said, so far this one isn't loading. So now I'm just waiting on the other one to come in. The audio is a little quiet. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, here, I'll give you video all the time or only when we are presenting? Only when you're presenting is fine. Okay. Yeah, let me here. I'm going to give you another presentation because once again, I haven't gotten yours in there yet. Maybe. Yeah, see if you can drive this one, Rick. Once again, single click on the slide and then you can advance, but I haven't gotten your PowerPoint yet. You may, like I said, it may turn into that you have to drive. Where's the button supposed to show up to? Uh, to the left hand side, there should be like an action bar. Yep. Okay, there we there go. There you go. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right, now we'll and then just yep. right click on my face and you can pass presenter privileges back over. Okay, now you should have it. Oh, it's Perfect. still passed. There you go. Now it should have it. Okay. Yep. And can you guys see me advancing those? Yes. Perfect. I said, hopefully yours will show up. If not, like I said, we'll just have you drive from your desktop. Okay. Because I'm not seeing it yet. I think it's uh, time, right? It's 3.30. Yeah, I think they're supposed to be kicking this off, but I mean, are, are people in here, uh, Ray, start hearing about our intelligent and autonomous power plants? Basically, in the breakout room, that other people are going to come into. I suppose is that is that what's going to happen? I think that's where we are. There we go. Okay, one more file share, and then we'll get we'll get started. Okay, we'll give it till five after because I said we, we were, it said that it was going to start around 3.40, so we just want to make sure the people that are in that initial session are able to come in. Thank you, everyone, for joining thus far. So if you are at the Intelligent and Autonomous Power Plants Grand Challenge breakout session, you are in the right place. I'm getting ready to present here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, and I'm on the floor. You hear someone typing away. Yeah, I was going to say, someone's typing with purpose. That's me. Just remember to mute. Thanks for calling <laughs> me out, line, but. Yeah, we, we all have uh, muting liberties in this one. So uh, let's make sure to 
to it, mute when, when you're speaking. interesting is that WebEx, WebEx is brutal on typing. You know, some of the other apps you can just type away and you don't hear it, but something about WebEx. <laughs> They haven't they haven't implemented a uh, noise canceling yeah. algorithm for that yet. At least they're not a bandwidth hog. Teams is brutal on networks. Maybe that's what Teams is doing in the background, canceling out that clicking. <laughs> Everybody just learned tap dancing over COVID pandemic lockdown. <laughs> All right, we're at 335. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, well, I guess we'll get started. So I'm Steve Seachman. Thank you for coming to the Intelligent Autonomous Power Plant's Grand Challenge through AI's, uh, AI's or EFRI's AI initiative. Um, thanks for coming and, and very excited about the team we have today that will be able to discuss this. Um, looking for some great discussions and getting this, uh, this grand challenge kicked off. Uh, without further ado, because we've got a lot of content to go through and once again, hopefully some open discussion to get through. So um, just giving you a quick agenda of where we are. Um, so we're going to go through an overview. Uh, myself and Kelly Rose, who's co-leading this effort, um, she, she willingly came forward and said she was going to help us uh, co-lead this effort. And I think it's going to be a great collaboration between us and any TLDOE to do that. Um, then we're going to, to, to get to our panel member presentations. Uh, you see we have a, a star-studded uh, panel here um, ready to, to provide some information and their perspectives from all the different different uh, dimensions and, and aspects of, of this area of autonomous and um, intelligent power plants. And then we're going to open it up for uh, an open discussion. Uh, panelists may ask questions, but we're also looking for you to also ask questions. You can do that through the chat. Um, and if there's any other opportunities within the participation, you can also raise your hand um, and do that as well. And if we need to unmute your line, we can, but we are looking for open discussion during that time. And then at 530, we're going to adjourn. So why are we here? I know that um, uh, Jeremy said that he was going to provide an overview on the um, Intelligent and Autonomous Power Plant's uh, grand challenge, but what are the strategic drivers for this? Well, we know in thermal generation as well as nuclear generation, um, we're looking for these plants to be more flexible, more consistently flexible, while optimizing O&M costs, because we know that you know, O&M budgets are not increasing, they are certainly decreasing. Um, keeping costs competitive, we want these as flexible as possible, we want them to be able start up and shut down as as much as possible while um, keeping costs low all with a, a workforce that is asked to cross train much more than they did in the past so these are not people generally that are growing up with the plants these are people that are learning it on the fly and asked to do um, many different activities across the plant as a whole so I mean that, that's just kind of the main reason why we're here is we're trying to figure out ways to uh, improve upon the understanding of the plant and give people as much information at their fingertips as they can while automating those processes um, at the plant that once again could be done more manually in the past when they weren't actually to be done as consistently as they are now. So this is something that we've talked about um, many times, actually, through um, previous engagements that we've had uh, at EPRI. But you know, mapping this this idea of autonomous power plants, it comes down to basically three areas that have lots of boxes in between. I know that these are not all inclusive, but it comes to getting that real time information, doing distributive and adaptive intelligence um, with that real time information, so it can uh, learn on the fly, and then being able to make an action and response from it. Either once again and automated or providing that opportunity to the subject matter experts, but once again, moving that information further down than it was in the past. And how do we see doing that with um, some of the activities we've been doing within EPRI? Um, also, you'll be hearing from some of our panelists as well, but we're looking at doing that through um, improved sensors and instrumentation and also using the right sensors at the right time to get that information out. Uh, we have, and then, of course, analyzing that data, integrating that data, and visualizing that data. 
and then moving towards the advanced controls and automation. So once again, uh, using that information to make controls decisions at the plant, making that monitoring and diagnostics actionable. And then of course, as, as I just mentioned, getting to the point of really monitoring and diagnosing the problem so we can make um, actions based on those decisions. So um, this is something we've been talking a lot about this week, both in probably the AI Summit as well as the Generation Advisory meetings that we've been having this week, is that obviously we're going through an energy transformation, and this plant digitization is becoming increasingly important during that energy transformation for those strategic drivers that I mentioned previously. Um, the, the the, the grid is becoming much more integrated. Uh, we, we have this giant, um, uh, you know, push to be more environmentally responsible, as well as um, looking at an economy-wide decarbonization. So, I mean, we see that this is going to be um, component agnostic as we move forward. Um, there's going to be optimization problems in renewables, but also on keeping our thermal fleets, once again, as flexible and consistent as possible while lowering those O&M costs. So some of the key activities that we're doing at EPRI within this area, uh, we have uh, several programs that are actually dedicated to intelligent and autonomous power plants. So the first one is the one I'm managing, so that's why I put it first. Uh, it's Program 227, Process Controls and Automation, uh, which is looking at advanced process controls. Uh, and, and strategies for flexible operations, but also at looking at automating those processes as, as we move along. And once again, we'll be hearing from some of our panelists on uh, where we are in that maturity level. Um, other things that we're looking at are improvements in existing process controls, such as understanding our DCSs and um, operational improvements through those DCSs. Um, alarm management logic techniques, which we'll be looking at AI uh, to understand and move as uh, the mission of the plant changes. And then, of course, we do look at the actuation techniques as well. You can have the smartest controls in the world, but if you have one leaky, dumb actuator, it's really not going to move you down too far. So we really want to make sure that we are looking at actuation as well while we're to minimize process variability when we're starting to incorporate um, more automation into these plants. Um, also, we know that there's going to be lots of challenges coming up as we um, change fuels and start looking at um, other power resources, so on um, some of these low carbon processes. So um, we know that those challenges and optimization problems will continue to exist. Um, and, and that last bullet there, looking at optimization techniques for plants, unit operations, and fleet. So once again, those optimization problems are not going to go away um, as we start to integrate and have um, additional resources on the grid. So um, we're going to continue to look at that within this program. Another program within the generation sector is monitoring and advanced data analytics, program 228. Um, this one is looking at integrating monitoring, diagnostics, and applied analytics in the power plant, um, as well as monitoring and diagnostic centers, driving approaches for inten intentional data um, for collection and utilization. So once again, um, making best use of the data that you have, developing fault diagnosis. So once again, giving more information to that subject matter expert so they don't have to dig as much and can make that decision much quicker. Um, one of the biggest successes that they've had in that program is this continuing online monitoring uh, guidance that starts at a high level of setting up that type of um, uh, program within your particular organization, but also offering quick guides for particular pieces of equipment to say what sensors will um, be effective at measuring what type of problems um, and how many you should be doing. And, you know, obviously it's importance and prioritization as faults come down. So very extensive, very exciting that they've had that available. Another one is this road mapping for digital technology implementation. So this is um, your company starting to look at um, digital technologies. Where do you start? where are your shortcomings, what sh should you be looking at, um, and, and they're providing that opportunity as well through this program. And then lastly, of course, measurement gaps, sensor development, and demonstration support. So really looking at where um, instrumentation still needs to be developed to um, improve your plant digitization journey. Um, from our nuclear side, we have our plant modernization, uh, which runs very much in parallel with those particular programs, but something that's been brought up um, in that program, which is really important, um, and I'll probably have to give them royalties later, is um, basically down the lines of not doing AI for the sake of AI. And this is something that they also brought up in the plenary session during our generation advisories this morning. Um, so it's basically down the lines of, we know that AI it has capabilities in this area, 
but we also know that there's other practical applications that can be um, looked at as well. So they're looking at road mapping as well and building that uh, technology summary and business cases on many of the areas of plant digitization and getting to the point of um, intelligent and autonomous power plants. Um, another place that we've been looking on our nuclear sector, and uh, we'll be working closely with them on our generation sector, is the Autonomous Advanced Reactor. Uh, we've been doing extensive research on um, plant automation on the generation side, and um, they're starting to look at that as well on the nuclear side, uh, something they're going to start kicking off in early 2022. Um, but we're, uh, they understand that, once again, having additional flexibility in these plants is very important for them to continue to stay viable and move towards that um, autonomous autonomous and intelligent power plant. So um, just another one that we're moving forward with. A couple other projects that we want to highlight, and this one's been going on for nearly five years, I believe, is our I4Gen Digital Technologies Working Group. This is the one that kind of started it about five years ago, where um, we just developed a collaborative opportunity within our generation sector to start sharing those ideas, providing extensive deliverables in this area, looking at maturity models for plant digitization, um, and just you know using that collaborative model that EPRI provides to um, create those and make sure that they're proper properly vetted. So it's another um, activity. Cassie Chabon is the lead in that particular um, activity. If you have additional uh, questions for that, please let me know, or you can contact Cassie. That SPN number is also available there. If you want to go to epri.com, plug that in, and it can give you some additional information. But there's been, I think, 20 deliverables out of this particular working group just to provide that baseline for um, the, the, the intelligent and autonomous power plant. And then another project, and the last one that I'll bring up before I pass this over to Kelly, um, is our digital demonstration facility. This actually sparked from the I4Gen working group. Uh, we had several uh, demonstrations going on within that uh, uh, within that project, and then one of our uh, hosts or one of the members of that, which we'll hear from later, said, "Hey, can we set up a site where we um, set up the infrastructure needed to um, better fast track these digital technologies?" At one location so we can see the cumulative benefit um, of plant digitization at one location and we said absolutely so we have six utilities with international uh, participation that are currently um, working on this particular project um, at a host site that's that's um, a combined cycle unit but also has coal-fired units as well um, 12 total projects going on there with our, our DOE projects um, ones being funded through the digital demonstration facility infrastructure projects Projects, all down the lines of monitoring um, and, and diagnosis, getting to the point of additional instrumentation and um, evaluating that as well as um, controls and automation. You can see that there's lots of collaboration going on internally at EPRI as well as external. Uh, we have three universities, a national lab, and se seven technology providers, as well as an OEM that's been involved in those projects. So very excited that we have this up and running, um, and we're looking to see those benefits um, of those multiple demonstrations going on at one site. So this is just an overview of those projects going on. I just wanted that to provide that to you um, as the working group. Once again, super excited that we were able to pull this working group together. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity to, to show additional collaboration within, um, within this sect and, uh, and showing how important it is that we continue to um, pursue this intelligent and autonomous power plan um, as we move forward. So with this working group that we are just establishing and getting kicked off today, uh, we, we are looking at um, establishing a monthly meeting that's going to last about 60 minutes where we do some roll call, do some announcements of things that may be going on in this area, and then give the floor to one of the, the working group members to do a project deep dive. That way we can um, start looking at collaboration opportunities. People can jump forward, ask questions, say where they have things going on in parallel. Um, we really wanted to make this multidisciplinary, hitting every aspect of this this. Uh, um, this problem, we know that it's going to take more than just more than just EPRI or more than just government or more than just uh, our OEMs to do that. So we thought it was really important that um, we try to uh, reach out to as many people as we can. The other thing that's great about it is it's free to participate. We just need your time. And if you have um, others that may be interested within your organization that may want to participate, please let us know. So I have my contact information there as well as Kelly Rose, which um, I'm going to be inter uh, introducing in just a bit. Um, um, so just let us know about that. 
So today's discussion, like I said, I cannot be happier that all of these people said, sure, we can talk um, and, and give this uh, um, their perspectives on here. You can see we have utilities, very um, important players on, on the vendor side. Um, we have uh, academia, we have government, and we have consultants. So pretty much every aspect of this we have on this panel, and these people have been in it for many years. We have many years of experience that are sitting on this call. I am flattered that all of them were willing to, to participate and, and most importantly I mean that Kelly was willing to co-lead this with me so with that I want to pass this over to Kelly um, as I get her stuff set up let's see that would be that's good on one moment well Steve's loading up I'll just say you know it's it's a pleasure to be here and I'm really looking forward to the the conversation and discussions that are to follow Thanks, Kelly. And now I'm going to give you presenter privileges, but before I get you started, I want to give a quick introduction of who Kelly is and why I'm excited that she has decided to co-lead this with this. So Kelly is the interim director, technical director for NETL's Science-Based AIML Institute, or what they are calling SAMI, as you can see over her uh, right-hand shoulder, left-hand shoulder. She is also a GIA Day Scientist Researcher and Research Portfolio Lead with the National Energy Technology Laboratory's Research and Innovation Center. Kelly's work involves development of new data-driven methods and tools for analysis of energy materials, offshore energy, oil and gas, rare earth elements, groundwater, and geothermal systems. She's busy. Kelly is the associate editor for the Journal of Sustainable Energy Engineering and NETL's technical for portfolio lead for offshore energy research. She is the co-author of more than 100 published data sets, journal publications, and technical studies. And throughout her career at NETL, Kelly has had the honor of mentoring more than 50 STEM research interns and fellows. She holds the following degrees in geology. She has her Bachelor's of Science from Denison, Master's of Science from Virginia Tech, and her PhD from Oregon State. So Kelly, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Steven. I swore I sent you the smaller bio. I'm not sure. I must have goofed. I apologize, folks. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. I'm gonna keep my remarks relatively um, short, but I wanna introduce this audience to Sammy because you are welcome to engage with us. Um, this is an opportunity to catalyze connections between the, the Department of Energy, um, specifically through the National Energy Technology Lab and the Office of Fossil Energy Carbon Management, um, and stakeholders like yourselves in, in industry, academia, et cetera, around the themes of science-based AIML and how to integrate those solutions, per Stephen's introduction um, with EPRI, uh, from the R&D sector, where we're mostly based, into the commercial sector over time. So the mission statement for SAMI, supporting transformation of FECM's uh, arena using science-based AIML methods to accelerate applied technology discoveries, workforce evolution, um, and strategic partnerships is, is key. And conversations like this are, are vital to, to the, um, us achieving that mission. SAMI's just a year old actually this month and uh, i was asked to take on the the lead role for sammy uh back in january uh so about nine months into the the tenure here but i am you know working with a really strong group of colleagues both at netl but also some external advisors um, like jonathan Bouts, who comes from uh the defense side of of things and works at lidos now um and again you know we're combining the strengths of DOE's research um, in energy computational arenas with our partners to try to innovate solutions to next generation challenges in the energy sector. AIML has actually been around for, for quite a bit. We've all gotten very used to the, the, the smartphone in our pocket, our, our virtual external brains, which are just a, one example of you know, AIML enhanced technologies that we 10 years ago even you know, weren't nearly as reliant on. Um, a lot of those types of activities coming out of the social media, online shopping, et, et cetera, sec sectors are very routine. They're very systematic. Um, and, and so they, they have really led the, the fray as far as um, the innovation of AIML at scale. 
machine learning as a, as a discipline has been around for decades. It's, it's really the ability to use massive amounts of data and information, integrate less structured knowledge to address these more complex systems and innovate solutions to these problems that is, that is really changing things over the last decade. Um, so we've seen this happen with the big tech sector, Silicon Valley sort of solutions, but when you start talking about the power sector and, and other energy um, related applications, we're talking about very complex systems, multivariate, multidisciplinary. Um, and and that's that's where Sammy's trying to accelerate answers that are reliable, um, trustworthy, and understandable. We're also trying to help facilitate access to appropriate data to, to drive these solutions um, and development of the right types of models and capabilities as, as um, you know, research teams chip away at different facets of, of these challenges and then graduate those solutions when appropriate, when they're understandable, validated and, and tested up the technology readiness level scale and, and out into the commercial space. Um, so we've got sort of a three pronged approach through the Institute that we are that we are implementing. One is uh, we'll come back to the, the data platform at the end um, and how that is helping catalyze and more efficiently meet these goals. But the research teams in particular are focused on, again, developing those AI ML models and or technology solutions, um, but also understanding what kinds of standards and, and foundational um, criteria we need to be developing to test those capabilities, understand them, explain them to consumers. Because when you're working at the scales and with the volumes of information, either temporally or volumetrically from, you know, depending on the problem, it can be really challenging to know if you can trust the result. Um, and so we're working on those types of solutions as well, so that adoption, those barriers to adoption in, in different um, research domains are not, are not a barrier to, to seeing these things uh, push, push into the commercial sector over time. Um, some of the areas where NETL and FACM are already working in the AIML space, even before SAMI was launched, uh, includes power plant resiliency and reliability advanced materials discovery, and then um, very much a lot of activities with regards to subsurface systems. And even with the, the current goals globally to pivot to a net zero carbon um, economy, there's so much opportunity with regards to these types of fossil energy carbon management systems um, to mature out of the, the types of um, work that's already been in progress, as well as innovate new solutions with partners like Equity <clears throat> and the folks that are here today um, to address the next generation suite of problems as well. Just by way of example, um, for this particular group with regards to examples, you know, those big lofty themes are, are wonderful, but it's like, all right, the devilish details, the real research and I is, is where things actually happen. This is just one example, not gonna dive into the details, but but I believe these slides are available. Um, you know, reinforcement learning is one technique that's an artificial intelligence mach machine learning technique um, being used by teams at NETL uh, to improve augmented controls, uh, to reduce pollution in power plants associated with the FECM sector um, and specifically, you know, looking at those emission um, sources and using reinforcement learning to understand how to reduce control errors and thereby reduce the pollution associated with these, these systems. Another second example, just real briefly here, um, we've got computational scientists at NETL who are working with some of the industry leaders in the tech industry side of things like NVIDIA. Just one example, we actually have several other relationships with major outside Silicon Valley groups, um, but they're working to imply physics informed neural networks, which is again, just another um, artificial intelligence modeling type of tool to innovate and develop energy conversion devices for boiler optimization for a wide array of application areas that you see here, 
um, to understand structural mechan uh, mechanics of those boilers, to understand cyber and physical security related activities, command and control related um, challenges. So there's there's a number of ways. The advantage something like a, a pin offers is it's using the physics of the system in question and it doesn't rely as much on, it doesn't need as much explicit data to drive the uh, the outcomes. So there's there's different ways to tackle challenges associated with power generation um, systems and many more than just those two quick highlights there. Um, one other quick uh, announcement that I think is very exciting. Recently, our principal deputy assistant secretary for fossil energy carbon management, Dr. Wilcox, and FECM leadership have authorized um, a new effort to develop out um, what we're calling the Energy Data Exchange EDX++ framework, which will build off of the data related computing resources that NETL FECM has been developing over the last decade to couple the data with compute. So our on-prem HPC GPU clusters like Joule and Watt, but also to con connect to commercial compute resources in the cloud that are becoming more de jure by an array of users. The goal here is to make it more efficient for FECM affiliated research teams and partners to interact with this data and put it to use to address a wide array of challenges and needs while innovating and expediting um, the research goals of those teams as well. So they don't have to worry about having the right infrastructure in their hip pocket. It, at least the starter infrastructure will be available to them. Um, through that EDX++ platform, which will be coming out here in the next 6 to 12 months. This was just a recent announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago of this investment in, in accelerating our AIML breakthroughs by enhancing and improving the, the technology and infrastructure available to our, our research, research teams and partners going forward. Um, there's a lot more going on in SAMI, but really the, the folks that we want to to have you guys engage with and hear from today um, are in the panel that follows. So um, I just encourage folks to check out the website. We are going to have be deploying um, an email-based news um, update uh, blog that will be coming out soon called AI for AE, which stands for AI, Artificial Intelligence for Applied Energy. Uh, it's just another way to, to catalyze knowledge sharing and and share successes and again expedite connections for across the research to the academic to the the commercial sector um and uh without further ado steve we will transition i believe to the the next speaker who i will be introducing so um, thank you all again for the opportunity to just introduce SAMI briefly. Um, there's a lot of facets to SAMI. This is just one area where SAMI is supporting AIML for the FECM community. Um, but now we're going to pivot to um, Chetan Uchara, who goes by Chet and is a principal engineer in the Southern Company Research and Development. Um, he has degrees, including a PhD in chemical engineering. Um, and leads the fossil fleet modernization project as part of the generating fleet R&D team at Southern Company Research and Development. Uh, he's developed research strategies and evaluated carbon capture, mercury and air toxic standards um, and effluent limitation guidelines, EGLs technologies. He's also supported Alabama Power's 25 megawatt, uh, megawatt carbon capture project. Uh, more recently, his focus has shifted to plant modernization for operations and maintenance cost reduction and flexible operations. Uh, he's developing digital technologies such as advanced controls, sensors, and analytics. He collaborates directly with external organizations like um, EPRI and the U.S. Department of Energy. He also serves as an advisor for EPRI's instrumentation controls and automation research program. And finally, under this program, his primary initiative is developing an infrastructure to enable digital transformation at power plants, which seems highly resonant, all of that with uh, the goals of this panel. So without further ado, Chet, please uh, take the stage. 
Thanks, Kelly, for the introduction. Um, I want to talk to you today about some of the uh, R&D work we are doing on uh, controls and analytics at Southern Company for fossil generation. Uh, Steve, can you go to the next slide, please? So, uh, so if I if I if you look at the uh, future energy cycle, uh, to me it looks very complex. So, uh, here I have uh, different bubbles for how the future energy uh, cycle may look like. Uh, so, you're going to have a centralized generation, uh, which can be uh, fossil plants with uh, carbon capture, uh, and it could be advanced nuclear, uh, and then. Uh, from, or it could be large scale solar and wind uh, generation. And from these uh, generating sites, you're going to be transferring the electrons for end use applications through the uh, power delivery system. Uh, you are also going to have uh, distributed energy resources uh, like rooftop uh, solar, uh, storage, fuel cells, and, and things like that. So they are also going to be producing uh, energy for end use application. and. You, you, you'll have uh, behind the meter uh, uh, technologies at the, uh, at the end use side. And then uh, the final bubble is the sust developing sustainability solutions. So we are moving away from uh, uh, fossil based uh, fuels uh, in a decarbonized world to more of a mineral based fuels. Uh, so we will be mining a lot of minerals for batteries, fuel cells, so um, recycling them, uh, making best use of all these minerals will become critical uh, for a, a successful uh, a future energy cycle. Uh, so, so if you look at all these bubbles in the, in the future, there is one thing that is applicable for all these bubbles, and that is data. So from all these systems, we are going to be producing a lot of data. Uh, so we should uh, make sure we know how to make use of these data for to, to produce actions that are valuable uh, for for our company and for our customers so uh, data analytics uh, is becomes a very important aspect of the future energy cycle and uh, and r d is required in this area to uh, generate value from the data we are collecting from uh, from these uh, cycles uh kelly next uh steve next uh, slide yeah, so, uh, so if you look at on the control side, uh, what type of R&D uh, would we need uh, uh, now and in the future? Uh, so the way we uh, operate our power plants, uh, it's, it's on site by the operators. Uh, so uh, we have control room on site and we have people and we have operators uh, controlling the, the, the power plants. Uh, so in the future, what, what could uh, power plant operations look like? So maybe we go from on-site operations by, oper uh, by operators to more of an autonomous operation with minimal human intervention. And, and once we are uh, successful with that, then maybe we, we can start looking into remote operating centers. So uh, from one uh, central location, you can control multiple uh, power plants. So. So to go from where we are now to where we would like to go in the future, uh, a lot of controls related uh, R&D uh, is required. So, um, uh, so there is a need to do some R&D in that area so that we can uh, maybe sometime in the future go to remote operating centers. So, so we looked at all these different R&D areas on the data analytics side and also on the control side. And uh, we thought uh, we should start some initiatives at Southern Company to address these uh, R&D needs. Uh, Steve, next slide. So what we did was we started a, a research center called the Digital Demonstration Facility at one of our power plants. It's called Plant Berry. It's located in uh, Mobile, Alabama. And the, the mission of the uh, R&D center is to develop an infrastructure to accelerate technologies uh, for uh, flexible operations and also for O&M cost reduction. So as we'll have more renewables in our generation mix, uh, the fossil plants need to be more flexible. And also uh, we have to lower our O&M cost to, for the fossil plants to be more competitive. Uh, and uh, we also need to develop tools and techniques to improve our 
process and as asset management. So by doing that, we can optimize how we operate our power plants. So, uh, so we decided to uh, develop this uh, research center with the support of uh, EPRI uh, and its uh, and its members. So, so it's an EPRI facility. Uh, Steve, next next slide. And we have uh, several uh, members, funding members to the uh, to the research center. So we have a good mix of uh, electric utility uh, companies and oil companies. Um, so. Uh, so it's a collaborative work we are doing with EPRI. Uh, we get input from all the funding members to see what areas we should be working on, on controls and analytics. And then we develop uh, research projects to address uh, those issues. Uh, Steve, next slide. So, the, so we are mainly looking at three R&D areas to, uh, uh, in, in the area of controls and analytics. So the first one is the advanced controls. So uh, so we uh, we have we use uh, controls uh, to run our power plants. Can we uh, use advanced controls to uh, to improve our uh, process control loops? Uh, there there are some process control loops that are hard to control uh, with existing PIDs. So can we use some advanced controls to improve the uh, uh, the process control of these uh, control loops? Uh, the the second area is uh, advanced sensors. Um, so uh, we, we want to see if there are any uh, sensors that we can use uh, to measure uh, new process variables uh, or uh, have a lot of sensors so that we can um, get data from different assets and we can improve the uh, our asset management. Uh, and the third area is uh, advanced process and asset management tools. So we, we will be collecting a lot of data from sensors um, and we'll be improving our controls. So. Um, can we use that information to uh, improve our uh, process and asset management tools? So that's the other area we'll be focusing in this uh, re research center. Uh, so, but the main thing we want to focus on when we select projects is that uh, these technologies that we are looking at should be uh, at scale. We, we, we want to demonstrate these technologies at scale. So any technology that we uh, evaluate we should be able to uh, easily integrate with our existing solutions because uh, if we have a standalone technology uh, for a particular use case, it 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 becomes uh, uh, very difficult to scale it for the entire fleet. So it may, it may be available at, at one site for a small application, but uh, there may be a champion for that. But once the champion leaves, since it's not integrated throughout the fleet, uh, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it, it is not sustainable. Uh, so, so we want to demonstrate technologies that can be easily integrated with our existing infrastructure. So it should be at scale. It should, should be demonstration at scale. Uh, Steve, next slide. So, um, so what are some of the things that we are looking at uh, uh, for the infrastructure at the digital demonstration facility? So we have we have purchased we have purchased a simulator, a high fidelity combined cycle simulator. Uh, it's uh, the, the simulator is from tracks with uh, Ovation uh, Emerson controls uh, for a balance of plant. Um, uh, and so, so what we want to do with this high fidelity simulator is that we want to look at uh, control loops uh, that give us trouble uh, uh, in, uh, in how we uh, control our power plants, in, uh, in mainly combined cycle plants. Uh, so, uh, so we want to use this simulator uh, to try new algorithms, advanced algorithms, uh, such as uh, model predictive control uh, for uh, things like steam temperature control, drum level control. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we want to uh, evaluate these advanced controls, see uh, what type of challenges we would have in implementing these advanced controls. And once we uh, learn these challenges, then we can uh, uh, and once we have a solution for these challenges, we can uh, we can implement these uh, solutions in the in the real in the real plant in the real real DCS system. So so the purpose would be uh, of the simulator would be to uh, develop advanced control strategies for implementation in DCS. Um, so we, we, by having this infrastructure, we believe that we can reduce the time of implementing advanced controls in the real power plant. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Steve, next slide. Uh, 
so on the the other infrastructure that we are looking at uh, at uh, uh, the other infrastructure we have at the digital demonstration facility is that we we have installed a lot of sensors for uh, condition based monitoring so um, so we installed uh, uh, different uh, types of sensors like accelerometers for vibration uh, infrared cameras uh, current and potential transformers for motor current signature analysis and we installed all these sensors on rotating assets uh, as, uh, of, for gas turbines, uh, steam turbines, uh, uh, things like lube oil pumps and, and uh, uh, all the assets uh, 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 related to gas and steam turbine. Uh, we have these sensors installed. We, have, we also have uh, sensors installed on rotating assets for cooling tower and all this data uh, is being collected by uh, the Bentley Nevada systems, Inside CM from uh, National Instruments, um, and uh, with, through, mainly through uh, through CREOs, and all this data is coming to our monitoring and diagnostic centers. So, so now we have data coming in from different assets to our monitoring and diagnostic centers, uh, center, and we have advanced pattern recognition tool at the uh, at the monitoring and diagnostic center. So, whenever we see some uh, uh, faults and symptoms, uh, we can uh, 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 look at that and uh, take corrective actions uh, to fix the issues we see at our MND center. So, so the, the so the purpose of this uh, sen uh, sensor infrastructure at, at DDF is we want to create a baseline uh, uh, infrastructure at 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 a combined cycle plant, and then we can use this infrastructure to compare with some new sensors that may come uh, to the market. And also new type of analytics that may come uh, to us uh, in the future for condition based monitoring. So, the, so the, the, the infrastructure we have is mainly for improving our condition based monitoring uh, practices at, at, uh, at Southern company and it, this can also be used for every members. Uh, Steve next slide. So, uh, finally, I want to talk about some of the projects we are doing uh, at uh, under uh, digital demonstration facility. Uh, so we, we do a very good job of uh, condition based monitoring since we have installed a lot of sensors now at our power plants and it's coming to our monitoring and diagnostic center. Um, but now we want to see, can we do something better than condition based monitoring like predictive analytics uh, remaining useful life and, and things like that. So we started a project with EPRI on that uh, on, on an asset. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a boiler feed pump asset. Uh, we wanted to start simple first. Uh, so we want to see if we can use uh, predictive analytics on that, uh, and is that something uh, people at at our company are going to use it? Is is it is it, is it reliable? Uh, how can they use that tool for asset management? So those are some of the questions we are trying to answer through this project. Uh, and then the second and third project is mainly around gas turbine. Uh, so we did a Pareto analysis on the O and M costs. Uh, that we spend on different assets in a combined cycle plant. And the number one asset where we spend a lot of money is gas turbine. So we thought uh, we should do uh, uh, a better job of managing gas turbines in our power plants. So, so we are working with EPRI to develop digital twins for gas turbines and also a combustion dynamic monitoring system to identify sensor tuning and hardware issues uh, on gas turbines. Uh, so that's mainly the second and third project we have uh, under uh, under the di digital demonstration facility the fourth one is uh, is uh, is improving the uh, the capabilities of uh, ecg which is a, a company that produces uh, an apr tool advanced pattern recognition tool uh, they have something called a diagnostic reasoner where uh, they are able to uh, develop an, uh, a network between the causes and symptoms of from different assets. So the alarms that we get in our monitoring and diagnostic center from different assets are mainly uh, uh, symptoms. But we still need to uh, uh, we, we still spend a lot of time uh, identifying the cause of the alarms. So our subject matter experts look at the alarms and figure out what the problem is, and then they take corrective actions. Uh, but the diagnostic reasoner uh, in ECG is able to. Uh, connect the causes and symptoms uh, based on the input from subject matter experts and then uh, develop a probabilistic based uh, 
a diagnostic reasoner for uh, different symptoms that we see uh, from our APR tools. So, uh, so we are collaborating this project with EPRI and we want to bring the information EPRI has on different assets from their subject matter experts and improve the intelligence of the uh, diagnostic reasoner that ECG is providing. Uh, the last two projects are on controls. So we have started a project where we are trying to improve the, uh, the automation of our uh, combined cycle plans. Uh, and the goal would be to go uh, after the single push button automation. Uh, can we push a button with, uh, and start the plan with minimal uh, operator in intervention and shut the plan down? Um, and uh, the other project we are doing is uh, we're looking at, uh, at control loops uh, that are hard to control, like steam temperature and drum level control uh, through uh, advanced process control, uh, such as model predictive control. Uh, so by, by doing these projects, I think uh, it will help us with our long-term vision of uh, remote operating centers for uh, uh, combined cycle plants and nuclear, nu and nuclear plants. So, uh, so that's the uh, end of my presentation. Uh, Steve, back to you. Thanks, Chet. And like I said, um, in the chat, feel free to write any questions that you may have for our presenters. Um, and we'll, we'll address them during the, the discussion time and also we'll probably um, pose a few other questions as well, just to let you know. So our next presenter is Rick Kephart from Emerson Power and Water Solutions. Very excited that he was able to join in as well. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in the power generation, automation, and control field. He started his career at Westinghouse Process Control Division, which was acquired by Emerson Electric in 1998. And he has held multiple engineering and management positions, as well as director of research and technology. In his current role as vice president of research and development, he is responsible for all system architecture hardware and software development for Emerson's Ovation Distributed Control System, DCS. Uh, Rick holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Penn State and a Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. So with that, I'll make you the presenter, and then you should be able to roll, Rick. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, and hello, everyone. And uh, today what I want to talk about is a little bit of technology, but I'm not going to go into a lot of details about technology. I want to talk more about the impact of technology on the human user of that automation and, and technology. Now, I, I come from a control system background, so I'm going to go at this sort of as a from a control standpoint, sort of very much like Chet was was talking about in the in the controls section there. Uh, but first, let me just give you a, a little bit here about about Emerson, you know, we're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but we have, you know, centers around the world. As um, Steve mentioned, uh, our lineage goes all the way back to Tesla, you know, so we were once Westinghouse. So our, our DNA includes um, hydro or, uh, pneumatic controls, analog controls, and we're now on our second generation of digital control systems, and we continue to expand that. And one of the things I want to talk about is a little bit of, of how the control system, the notion of a control system is now expanding and, and, and offering new features that, you know, just a few years ago really weren't part of a, a control system offering. So in the title, you probably noticed I used the, the term cyber physical human system. And I like to use that because that's a, a new sort of industry buzzword. And really what I mean by that is it's sort of the next generation of, of control systems, you know, as that scope of control systems, of, of the control system sort of expands. And if you look at a formal definition, you probably ask 10 people and you get 10 different answers, but I always go back to IEEE or EPRI or somebody like that as the, the, the defini actual definition. And it's really any system where physical plants and cyber technologies are, are coupled together. And certainly control systems are, are in that area. But it's very important that we think about the impact of that on the human, because in that system, the human being is really an integral part of that. And, you know, as you heard a little bit before, there's there's several components in that that I think are very important. And one is connectivity. And I can say from a control system OEM standpoint, we probably spend as much time now on connectivity as we do just about any other activity. There is so much connectivity, so much data being exchanged between machines, 
between machines and people. And we really want to be able to take advantage of all of that data and, and, and basically do something with it. Now, there's always automation associated with that, you know, feedback control actions, and that includes model based technologies and then maybe even some of the more advanced technologies that I'll sort of touch on here. When, and one of which is, is data analytics. And, you know, this goes back to machine learning and even AI, but particularly machine learning. How can we use that data? And I like to think of it this way. How can we use that data to sort of close a, a bit a wider control loop? And in that wider control loop, there's actually two controllers. One is the, the automation system and the other one is the human being, typically an operator. But, you know, there's various aspects. I'm going to focus on operations in the real time part, part here. But when you think about it, the human is really an integral, an active controller in that, that feedback loop. And we have to really think about that as we go forward. Another technology that's really gaining ground here is the use of digital twins. And, and Chet just talked about simulators, and simulators have been around for a long time. But now, sort of the next evolution of, of simulators is this idea of live digital twin, you know, with immense capabilities as far as accuracy and predictability, but having that digital twin actually running in, sort of in parallel with the plant and providing a real-time predictive data stream that sort of predicts future behavior. And that's very important for a lot of things, you know, very important particularly for the controls, the automated control functions, the automation, but also for things like operator situation awareness. And, you know, if you look at the formal definition of situation awareness, you know, one of those components is actually prediction. And the online digital twin really provides that. So if I think a little bit about the challenges we have here, I, I like to start off with, with talking about some of the challenges. And if, if I rank them, and this is sort of what we see, if I rank them, I, I, I see three major challenges that we have in the power generation industry today. And the first one is what we traditionally call workforce turnover. And I liked Kelly's term about workforce evolution because it really is an evolution. You know, we have a lot of experience that's walking out the door. And those of us who've been around for 30 years plus, I mean, we're on the endangered species list. That's not the norm for the up and coming uh, workforce. So you can imagine that, you know, an experienced person is being replaced by a less experienced person. But we do have one thing that's working in our favor. The, the up and coming generation is very used to using technology as a tool, as opposed to us dinosaurs who've been around for a while. And that we can take that, we can use that to our advantage as we introduce these new control techniques and, and new capabilities within the, the control world. The second biggest um, industry trend that we see is, the, is, is operations. Um, consolidation and remote operations, consolidating control rooms into some remote operation center. And almost always that translates in one way or another to less people doing more things and using how can we use technology to be able to enhance that person who is operating those multiple plants, you know, and, and, and keep their attention diverted, keep their attention diverted to, to a, where it needs to be, you know, and in, in, in impending off normal condition. And it may be as simple, you know, just as a shirt tuck to say, hey, you know what, there's a there's a, a condition, an off normal condition that is 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 developing here, and you really need to, to look at that. A third big area that, that we see is really just the, the market pressure. You know, and a lot of this, especially when you think about the thermal uh, generation and, and traditional fossil, be it coal, be it combined cycle is the introduction of renewables and the inter intermittency that the renewables place on the grid. And, you know, the basically the off normal conditions that can result from those, those variabilities in renewables. And so if, if I think about this, you know, these are sort of the, the, the big drivers for, for wanting to use some of this more advanced technologies. And, you know, again, it really comes down to making that human being you know, more effective. You know, and if you think of an off normal condition, that's really where we're, we're interested in is the off normal conditions. And, and when you think about it, you know, enhancing the operator situation awareness, interpreting complex data, you know, that's very important during an upset condition or an off normal condition, because that almost always starts out with a sort of, you know, 
uh, and not understanding the, the, the things are coupled in ways that they're not normally coupled and sort of peeling that back becomes very important because it's, it's typically has to be done very quickly and under a lot of pressure. So this is sort of the drivers, you know, what I, I see for, the, for, for using some of these more advanced technologies. And when you think about using advanced technologies, you know, one of the big things that jumps out is something that's called the automation paradox. And there's, if you look at a lot of the, the latest controls research, you know, over and over again, you see this control, this automation paradox come up. And basically what it says is that the more advanced the automation system is, the more important that human operator is that's that's utilizing that automation systems. And I'll tell you, if you want to look at examples, you don't have to look any further than aviation. And that's a perfect example. There's probably not more better trained operators, you know, airplane operators than, than pilots. But over and over again, when you see aviation disasters, very often it's because of disorientation of the the uh, of the pilot if the if some on an off normal condition and usually an off normal condition has more than one thing wrong so there may be you know sensors that are sort of lying to them and then the automation system in the case of an airplane may just turn off the autopilot turns off and now the human operator is faced with understanding that situation and figuring out what the what the appropriate manual control actions are for that so the same kind of things happen in in our industry you know, if you look at a lot of the newer operators, the skill of being able to operate a fossil plant manually is sort of dwindling. And if something happens on an off normal condition that the automation is having, the base automation is having trouble dealing with, it usually requires that human operator to, to intervene. And we want to be able to build systems and functions that sort of take an experienced operator, the knowledge out of their head and put it into the control system. You know, how can we deal with these off normal conditions and sort of that, that upper level control group that includes the, the human being? So that's, that's really the, the, the function of, of what I'm trying to talk about here. And, you know, if you look at it, if we look at it from a, an operation standpoint, I really think that there's, there's two base areas here. One is the human operator themselves, you know, which, and, and I sort of think of some of that as, as decision support very analogous to driver assist, you know, in all of the modern vehicles now, you know, if you are backing up and another car is coming by, the seat vibrates, you know, or if lane departure, if the, if you start to drift into the other lane, the, the control system in the car automatically pushes you back into that, that lane. So building those kinds of functions into the control systems to be able to make that human operator more efficient. And again, it could just be as simple as a shirt tuck. It may just say, you need to direct your attention here because it was an off normal condition developing. But then in that upper control system, the, the, the user of that information may actually be the control system itself. And we like to think of this as something called fault tolerant control. And this is where things get a little bit um, opaque. And what if we use that data to be able to build functions into the control system, sort of like that lane departure? So that the control system can now be a little bit smarter, another level of intelligence to be able to deal with some of those off normal conditions. I'll give you an example. You know, one of the examples that, that, that we've seen is a valve that's leaking by the seat. And this kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier as far as market pressures and dynamics that, that you know, renewables, not just renewables, but largely renewables uh, introduce in the, the fossil generation. So when we want to bring another Hurston train online, for example, a combined cycle plant, you know, typically there's commercial implications of getting that online fast and getting it started up fast. So in the case of a valve leaking by the seat, the control system now can sort of play the role of an experienced operator and either switch out the gains of the controller so that it doesn't work as hard and you know, continually keep beating on the valve, or maybe it actually switches in a different control strategy so that it uses the block valves, you know, now, certainly that's not optimal control, but it's control enough to be able to get past the hump that we're on. You know, so if we want to get that Hersey train online, for example. So these are just some of the, 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 the uh, examples of, of the technologies that we use. If you look at some of the, a little bit lower down, some of the other applications, you know, Chet talked about alarm rationalization, you know, being able to discern 
what the root cause of an alarm is whenever it comes in. You can imagine a situation you have a new operator and it's it's two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night, nobody else around, and all of a sudden you start getting a bunch of alarms. And how do I sort through those alarms? And, and alarms have been, I would say, a thorn in our side for a long time. And we've done made great strides on standardization for alarm management, but still discerning that what the root cause of that alarm is is really an experience factor. You know, so these technologies can help with that. Operator sense making. I sort of talked about that a little bit earlier, and that is during an upset condition. You know, how do I sort through all of this conflicting information and things that are interacting in ways that they don't normally interact? And we have the system actually do that and provide feedback and provide guidance, you know, operator guidance, basically. And then, you know, lastly, sort of that control automation that, that I talked about a little bit earlier with what we call fault tolerant control. You know, can we marry and you know, fuse some of these closed loop functions with the machine learning functions so that we can now recognize and act? appropriately on those particularly off normal conditions. So really the, what we look at this at Emerson, our way of looking at this is we call it automation transparency. We didn't make that up, you know, that's a that's an industry term. But really what's important here with these advanced automation systems, the more advanced they become, typically the more opaque the actions are. You can think of like a neural network, for example. You really don't know how the neural network arrived at the answer that it arrived at. You know, it's sort of a, a black box. And in real time, as we build these functions up, if the human operator doesn't understand the intent, the, goal, the goals, and the action of that advanced automation system, that almost always at some point will end badly. You know, so we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how we can give the operator visibility into those functions and really understand what these advanced functions are doing and again you know the further up you go in tech the technology stack the more opaque that that decision making tends to be on, from the system so we need to make sure that as we design these that we keep the operator and or the consumer of that whoever that might be but I'm, in this case operations you know up to date with exactly what's happening with that automation system so that they can participate as an active controller in that sort of upper control system level. So, you know, in conclusion, the operational landscape, you know, it's changing. You guys all know that better than I do, you know, with workforce turnover, workforce evolution, control room consolidation, remote operations, and automation is, you know, is as a control person, I obviously think automation is pretty much the answer, but it's not automation by itself. It has to be human system collaboration with that automation. And you know, then when you when you have the human as part of that control loop, it's really sort of what we call a semi-autonomous control loop, meaning that the system has all the autonomous and automatic control functions, but that operator is always aware of what they're doing, what the automation functions are doing, and can intervene when necessary. So supporting that function and 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 being able to keep that human being active in that that control loop, that upper level control loop is extremely important and that's an area for our, you know a lot of improvement and a lot of research so with that steve i think i'm next slide perfect thanks rick all right well while uh, steve is uh pulling up the next presentation yes thank you rick that was really interesting and i think there'll be some great discussions spinning out of the first two talks already but without further ado we would like to introduce the next panelist, Dr. Tim Lewin, is the Regents Professor <clears throat> and Executive Director of the Strategic Energy Institute at Georgia Tech. He is also a Founder and Chief Technology Officer of Turbine Logic, an, analytic, uh, an analytics firm working in the energy industry. Current and past board positions that he's held include governing advisory boards for Oak Ridge National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, which are all appointments. Um, within DOE, as well as an appointment to DOE's secretary to the National Petroleum Council and board member of, of the ASME International Gas Turbine Institute. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of ASME, APS, and AIAA, uh, and foreign fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. Major awards that he's been um, 
granted include the AIAA Lawrence Berry Award, the AIAA Pendray Award, and ASME's George Westinghouse Gold Medal. So without further ado, Tim, please uh, please take the stage. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, so as, th and thank you for the introduction. So as I said, uh, I'm kind of wearing two hats here. So one is I run the Energy Institute at Georgia Tech. So we have about a thousand people working across the whole space of energy. Great partners with with Nettle, by the way. Um, done been to Morgantown many, many times. And um, and uh, and then also the, the other hat I wear is this is a topic very near and dear to me. Um, I've been working with EPRI since about 2004. Um, you can actually go to the next slide on many of these topics and uh, actually have started a company that develops software and does consulting. In, in a range of issues around intelligence, automa automation, analytics um, in the power, the power industry. Um, and, you know, really, I guess what I would say is one of the things that we've really focused on with the solutions that we've done is not to try to develop a be all and end all platform, but really recognizing that most industries, most companies have have enterprise platforms that that they that they like to use, whether it's historians or automated or various machine learning approaches like automatic pattern recognition to really to, to really come alongside that. Um, you know, the next slide. So I think, um, you know, since I'm a little bit farther down in presentation order, what I thought I would do is get a little bit more in the weeds. Um, and actually, Rick's talk was a perfect intro to some of the points I want to make, because really, I guess what I want to emphasize here, and what I really want to dig into is this idea of where does the intelligence come from? You know, if you think about an intelligence intelligence system, where, where is the intelligence coming from, which obviously is a prerequisite for the, the autonomous piece. And what I really want to emphasize is that it best comes from sort of this, this very synergistic merging of these three big buckets, um, data, modeling, and experience. And I think probably there's a lot of back, a lot of analogy between what I'm calling experience here and what Rick called the user and, and the operator, basically the human. Uh, that the human that's part of this, but really, how do you best best bring all of these things together to to get to get actionable intelligence? Um, and so, you know, the actually, so what I'll do in the next three slides, I'll just dig into each one of these a little bit, a little bit more. So we'll go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about data, because at the end of the day, particularly when you start thinking about modeling, you know, again, intelligence in many cases, the, the what what we maybe call the system or the, or the model. The model is based upon a combination of sort of what I would call data-driven assets, excuse me, a data-driven understanding. So in other words, using data from the asset itself um, without necessarily knowing anything about the asset, but using the data from the asset itself to understand. Hey, Siri, set an alarm for 2.25 p.m. Um, to, to, to understand things about that asset, um, to make predictions about that, the asset's performance, or to control it, or to identify if there's an anomaly. And so if it's a data-driven approach, there's a lot of, there, there's, there's a thousand and one different ways this can go wrong. There's, there's a lot of bodies buried in terms of having the data that those data-driven approaches are. And so when we use words like artificial intelligence and machine learning, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oftentimes use the word data-driven models because the, those are simply ways of taking data from your asset and, and building a um, building basically an, an understanding model and understanding of those system. And so if we think about kind of what matters in terms of data, what I have here is this, this sequence, just thinking about increasing sophistication, moving all the way from collection at the top left to actually utilizing it for actionable insight. And so just, you know, there's issues around, do I have the right sensor package? And again, I want to emphasize, there's a lot of feedback here between this and, and, and the model, because you have to have the sensor at the right place. You have to be sampling the sensor at the right sampling frequency. You know, there's there were several presentations that talked about combustion dynamics monitoring systems, for example, which is a very high frequency phenomenon. And so in many cases, we find that, you're simp that, that plants simply aren't storing or or even um, acquiring data at the at, at the right frequencies. Um, you know, if you think about storage, you know, just lots of issues around being able to access or not access the the, the data that, that you might need. Just just and, and then aggregation. Um, you know, in many cases, what what the, you know you know if you think about a modern combined cycle power plant, which may have ten thousand data tags. That's a lot of data tags. Um, 
uh, there's a lot of sensors, a lot of things feeding in. And in many cases, a lot of sensors simply aren't working right. And this was referred to at several points as well as for inferring this is just how do you how do you do those data checks and and both know when your sensor's not working, which is what we'll talk a little bit more about later, but also just have have this built into your process for when you do when you do shutdowns or things like that, having a process to replace those. And I'll go to the next slide. Um, the next piece is, is sort of the, the experience piece. Um, and the idea here is just leveraging just the, the if we, we can go to the next slide. It's not letting me advance beyond this. It says oh. we have only four slides. <laughs> oh, great. Let me try again. Okay. Um, well, so the next piece is experience, right? And this is, this is really how do you tap into the knowledge and the understanding of, of, of users, operators, data records, and, and things like that. And again, there's a whole spectrum of sort of increasing formality in the process, increasing um, sophistication in terms of, of leveraging that experience. Because, um, and then the last thing I'll just talk about is modeling. You know the, the the modeling piece. I talked about data. I talked about experience and modeling, because again, really to me, where does intelligence comes from? It's the it's the synergistic bringing together of of those three things. Um, so next slide, modeling. Um, nice works, Steve. And then you know, and, and so what I want to emphasize is modeling um, and intelligence is not synonymous with machine learning and AI. Machine learning and AI are a piece of it. And in general, those are what we would call data-driven approaches. Again, where you take the data from the asset and you, um, you infer what's going on. But you know, data-driven approaches, machine learning approaches, don't know anything about your asset, right? You know, they don't know whether the data is coming from a power plant or whether it's coming from your toaster oven or whether it's coming from your smartwatch, right? And so, and so its ability to partic particularly predict and and outside of its experience set becomes becomes a real a real issue. And so this is where issue the, that last um, era, the physics modeling becomes really important because and, and frankly speaking, this is where the innovation is happening in the in the in the, in the modeling intelligence is, is seamlessly integrating the data the data driven approaches, which is from your machine, which has all the reality of the real machine, but also the, the underlying physics that at the end of the day, if it's a combined cycle power plant, you know what it is, you know how many compressor stages, you know what the compressor stages do, you know what the combustor does. You have a general understanding of, of these things and you can develop models for them. And in many cases, the, the work that we do, for example, in developing digital twins is developing sophisticated physical models but yet these oftentimes have all kinds of parameters, maybe different stage efficiencies, different secondary airflows, things like that, which you simply, you don't have the sensors, you don't know those. And so you need a way to extract, to, to infer those, which is what you, what you do with your data. And again, I wanna emphasize that in, in my opinion, um, I'll be interested to see if, there, if this generates some controversy, that where the innovation is happening in this space of intelligence is sort of, how do we best seamlessly integrate these um, a lot of people are, like to think that AI is sort of this magic black box, but really, frankly speaking, in, in, in my opinion, a lot of the AI that's out there is essentially a commodity. Um, and you can go to textbooks, you can find the algorithms. The reason that we're talking so much about it today is we have the ability to store and the computer speed to actually execute on those algorithms. But the algorithms are in classic textbooks. You can get them for free. You know what? What the AI algorithms in many cases do is they make it it's simple and easy and have good user interfaces. But frankly speaking, I just don't see a lot of a lot of differentiation between a lot of these industrial solutions that you see out there in in this space in terms of AI, just in terms of what's under the hood. We're, again, and, and so I'll just again emphasize where the innovation is happening is how do you seamlessly bring together all that all that knowledge and insight coming out of the plant's data with the physical model, with, with the experience. Um, go, to the, go to the next slide. Um, just if I think about just kind of issues and, and, and challenges, you know, just issues around data, ownership and access of data. You know, I, I, I own a small company and just, you know, this is, this is a huge issue for us. Um, but also I would just say in general, it's an issue for utilities. It's an issue for utilities. It's an issue for airline operators. 
is in many cases, <laughs> they find that they may not actually have access to their own data because it's, it's locked up by OEMs and things like that. So that's just something to be aware of. You know, this issue around data collection, really being intentional about what data is being stored, collected, sampling frequency, labeled, and so forth. And then the last thing, as I mentioned, is smart use of, 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 of artificial intelligence and machine learning. In many cases where we get involved is we work with companies where there's an, an enterprise sort of whiz-bang solution that the executive suite has bought into and it's being propagated across the organization. And that's, that's fine. That's great. But I mean, you can't use it to solve unsolvable problems. It, um, and, but then also the need for domain experts to really be able to, 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 to work with those packages and, and, and take that, that experience and that underlying understanding of these, of these physical assets and bring that to bear. Um, I, uh, so I think uh, one, I got two more slides. So in terms of what does Utopia look like, uh, this is a, maybe just a little tongue in cheek title. You know, again, just the issue of data and data management intelligence in many cases is, is predicated on um, increasingly data driven approaches. And it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing just the, the, the challenge of keeping all those sensors operating at the right time, keeping historians working and so forth. Um, and, uh, and then also I'm starting to repeat myself. So you know, just the experience in modeling is, is, is critical and really in, intimately merging those things. So I'll close just my the last slide. Just, I just five, uh, th this gives five case studies on some projects we've done with, a, with, um, with EPRI. And really a lot of our work I would say has been in democratizing, in quotes, I would say democratizing AI. It's not, it's not some magic thing. It's, 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 it's basic commodity algorithms, but then bringing those to bear for interesting problems like dispatch of your plant, you know, having a, a solid underlying model so that you can have better forecasting ability going into the future. Um, that bottom, the bottom left one talks about sensor health. You know, this has also already been mentioned earlier. Is, is that in particular, if you have an underlying physical model, you know, you can you can identify a sensor issue, and so it's not garbage in, garbage out into some some device. And you know, th this might be easy if a sensor is 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 going out of range with something ridiculous, but if it's more subtle, this becomes a, a real challenge because sometimes, for example, real real plant failures and sensor failures can look a lot alike. Um, that bottom right one, auto calibration, I referred to that earlier, but the idea is, again, this goes to, you develop a sophisticated physical model of the system, but there's a lot of parameters you don't know, and how do you, how do you learn those from the data and how do you continually update those as the, the ambient temperature changes, as the machine ages, and so forth. So with that, I think I will stop, and thank you all. Thanks, Tim. Much appreciated. So, uh, and, and he, you got an amen during that, just letting you know. So um, once again, keep those questions coming, and we'll, like I said, we'll certainly answer them as we have the discussion time. So I'm going to give David the opportunity to load his presentation. Uh, next, our next speaker is Dr. David C. Miller. He's a, the Senior Fellow for Strategic Systems and Analysis and Engineering at the U.S. Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Lab, where he leads the Institute for the Design of Advanced Energy Systems, or IDEAS. Uh, it's a collaboration among researchers from NETL, CNDIA, Lawrence Berkeley, uh, Carnegie Mellon, West Virginia University, Georgia Tech, Notre Dame. Uh, it's a very big collaboration there. IDEAS is developing next-generation multi-scale modeling optimization capabilities for the design of innovative advanced energy systems, including tightly coupled hybrid systems. The open source IDEAS integrated platform was recognized with an R&D 100 award in 2020. Uh, previously, Dr. Miller served as the technical director of the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative, or CCSI, and a leading team of over 100 researchers from five national laboratories and five universities that developed R&D 100 award winning CS CCSI tool set, which provide ways to maximize learning and reduce risk during the scale-up process for carbon capture technologies by guiding experimental and pilot scale testing. In 2016, he led the transition of CCSI to a second phase, which is applying the CCSI toolset to new carbon capture technologies. So Dr. Miller is a recipient of the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Exceptional Federal Service, Applied Science and Engineering, and prior to joining NETL, Dr. Miller spent a decade in academia rising to the rank of associate professor with tenure and continues to support engineering education through volunteer work with ABET and the AICHE. He earned his PhD in chemical engineering from, uh, it's going to pain me to say this, the Ohio State University. So uh, David, the floor is yours. 
All right, thanks, Steve, and, and thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to talk with you a little bit. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to uh, put together a few slides to, to talk about some of the work that we're doing within IDEAS on, on machine learning and AI, uh, particularly as applied to the design and operation of, of energy systems. And you know, just, just to uh, you know, reiterate in case uh, somebody didn't uh, sit through the first uh, several presentations, you know, some of the challenges that, that we're, we're facing now, you know, particularly are, are around um, increasingly integrated and dynamic uh, generation uh, and a increasingly dynamic integrated and uh, dynamic grid. Uh, and so in, in particular, uh, you know, some of the questions are, you know, on the generation side, how do you actually uh, design and operate these processes? How do you operate them in consideration that, you know, something like nuclear or, or a natural gas combined cycle is also interacting with uh, uh, solar and, and renewables uh, and, and the grid, um, which is behaving differently. And the linkage between those is it, often challenging to, to understand uh, and predict uh, over time, you know, which then results in, uh, you know, various assets having various dispatch profiles, which are shown along the, the bottom here, um, which uh, I might be able to use a pointer uh, and then actually point to things such as uh, the, the, the blue, which would be natural gas dispatch, uh, the, the, the black, which would be a, a coal plant ramping up and down, uh, the, the orange down here on the bottom being solar, uh, which ramps up during the day and then disappears at night, and then the, the, the variability of, of wind uh, in green, and this just happens to be from uh, a per period of time uh, in, in January. So to, to try to help address those challenges, particularly how do you optimize systems um, un under these conditions, uh, we developed something called the IDEAS Integrated Platform, uh, which, which is a computational platform based upon the idea of optimization and mathematical optimization as opposed to just simulation. Uh, and so what this does is it builds on advances in computing that have occurred over the last 20 years, not only from the hardware standpoint in that, you know, machines are much faster, we've got a lot more memory and we have a lot more hard disk space and storage space, but also from an algorithmic perspective in that we can solve problems that we could not solve before. And we know how to formulate problems in more general ways. And, and so essentially what this uh, incorporates is, is a modeling framework uh, that lets us represent both steady state and dynamic instances of all sorts of processes. Uh, and, and to use these models to answer questions such as conceptual design. So if we're making choices between multiple different configurations or technology options, optimizing a, a a plant either from a design standpoint or from optimizing operations, looking at optimizing control using advanced nonlinear model predictive control, uh, and coupling all of this with uncertainty quantification, recognizing that the data that we have and the data that we will get has uncertainty built into that, uh, including uh, tools such as robust optimization that lets us reduce technical risk by kind of quantifying what range of operating conditions are possible given the uncertainty that we have. Integral to, to making all of this work are a number of AI and machine learning surrogate modeling tools and capabilities that I'll talk in more detail about in a minute. Uh, these include Alamo, uh, which is a unique optimization-based uh, AI ML tool for creating models specifically tuned uh, to be able to be optimized and used within an optimization formulation. And, and PISMO, which is a Python-based tool set uh, that uh, works seamlessly within, within IDEAS. And then as we go to the larger scales, we, we also have capabilities looking at enterprise optimization for resource planning, uh, integrating with grid op operations, and then also down to uh, the material scale for optimizing materials that might go into, say, a, a carbon capture process. So the AI and machine learning tools specifically help us bridge across 
scales and, and across this entire tool chain. And um, what, what I plan to do with the uh, uh, remaining time that I have is, is give you two examples of, of how we're using some of these AI ML tools to solve real problems. I, I will note that uh, I, IDEUS is, is an open source platform. Uh, you can get it on GitHub uh, at, uh, at, at this location, uh, and it's a, uh, been created as a collaboration across uh, three national labs, and, and now we're up to four universities uh, um, that, that are part of our uh, uh, collaboration in, in building these and demonstrating them on, on a variety of projects. So, so the first example that, that I'd like to share is uh, some work that we've done on improving power plant operations using rigorous models. Uh, and so this, this was a partner with uh, Tri-State Generation and Transmission uh, with their Escalante uh, uh, power plant uh, in, in New Mexico shown here. And, and uh, four of the, the major outcomes that I wanted to highlight is you know, through our, our work in developing uh, detailed models uh, for this, uh, the plant was able to demonstrate a 44% improvement on minimum load uh, because through this modeling and through the use of the data and uh, data reconciliation capabilities, uh, we were able to identify that there was a, a de-aerator de uh, water hammer issue, figured out where that was so that could be corrected, and, and then identified opportunity for heat rate improvements uh, as the plant ramps up and down. We were also able to use these tools for uh, determining some alarm settings that would identify potential plugging uh, issues uh, more than twice as far in advance as what their previous system was able to do, uh, giving four to five day advance notice to avoid uh, some major incidents. Uh, and then we also uh, were able to combine this uh, with the boiler fatigue and lifetime modeling in order to determine at what rate does it make the most sense for the plant to be able to, to ramp, both to take advantage of uh, incentives from the, the grid, uh, but also to uh, avoid uh, boiler fatigue. So, so how were we able to, to build a model that was able to, to do this? And what, one of the keys of this is using our AI ML surrogate modeling techniques to be able to bridge scales. Uh, and specifically what we used is, is a tool called Alamo. And, and one of the key parts of, of modeling this overall process, which, which you see down here, is getting an adequate representation of the boiler. So the, the boiler is located here. Uh, and an important aspect of, of the boiler is getting the radiation right inside of the boiler on, on the fire side. And the way we formulated this is, is we actually used uh, um, a, a very detailed model, but that detailed model was too detailed for being able to optimize across the whole process. And so using our AI tools, we were able to convert the fire side piece of this into an algebraic surrogate model that then we could couple with a, an algebraic representation of the water side. The, the way this works in, in Alamo is it identifies automatically uh, the, the correct functional form and the right level of complexity of the surrogate model uh, by selecting from a number of different basis functions and then uses those basis functions, identifies which ones provide the right level of detail without overfitting. Uh, also unique to Alamo is it has what's called a constrained regression ability. So the fact that we can then couple what we know about the physics with the AI model that comes out in this surrogate uh, lets us be able to extrapolate. So, so for example, you know, the red line here shows that it might fit the data better, but if we know that we can't go below zero, for example, then the green line, which is, uh, at which we can generate, we can show that that actually fits the true function better. And it is actually then a better representation of the overall detailed model that then we can couple in with the uh, overall systems model. So, so we can take this, and, and then we've also used this 
to quantify the impact of load following on, on boiler health. And, and so, for example, taking the dynamic version of, of, of the model, uh, we could look at various ramping and tie that together with the stress in the, uh, in the boiler and in the uh, uh, tubes in order to then determine at different ramp rates uh, in terms of uh, percentage change per minute, you know, the number of cycles that you can have before a failure is likely to occur. And so as you would expect, you know, as, as the ramp rate increases, the time to failure or the number of cycles you know, actually goes down and it goes down quite a bit. And so this is uh, something that's able to help look at that trade-off of how you might want to be able to operate the plant. The, the second example that I'll take a, uh, a brief look at is how do you think about designing a process based upon what the grid's likely going to value or need in the future? And so th this is an opportunity for us to think about how do you actually link the design question for a, a new energy process or, or even thinking about adding carbon capture uh, to, to an existing process, what sort of operational flexibility do you need? And you know, could you perhaps gain some of that operational flexibility by adding energy storage uh, to your process? And will it make sense economically to do that? And so uh, be, because uh, generation and the grid are often coupled um, through, through a production cost model, which, which is the way um, uh, ISOs you know, typically have a bid process and then uh, settle uh, in the market. It, it's a way of, of trying to link these together. And so what we're doing in, in one project uh, is called Dispatches that uh, is utilizing the IDEAS capability. Uh, that, uh, and this is work that's uh, partially funded under the Grid Modernization Initiative is developing surrogate models using our AI ML techniques for electricity markets. So, you know, essentially what we're determining is for, for different types of, of, of generators uh, and different types of capabilities of that generator in terms of power generation, maximum, minimum, ramp rates, minimum up, down, uptime and downtime, et cetera, we can determine a, 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 a surrogate model that, that matches the revenue and dispatch that you're likely to, to get and use that then with a, uh, a design process. And, and this is just some, a, a simple uh, early example where we have a plant where we can design uh, different ramping capabilities uh, coupled with a battery for energy storage in order to look at what size and capabilities of this process will maximize the NPV of the overall process. So, so this is some work that we're actually doing uh, on a number of different case studies that involve both, both fossil-based plants, uh, looking at nuclear plants uh, of, of hybrid types, uh, as well as looking at uh, renewable-centric hybrids. Uh, we're also doing some similar work associated with uh, flexible carbon capture systems uh, with, uh, in collaboration with some external partners, as well as looking at uh, ways of coupling an NGCC with a direct air capture unit uh, with some, some variability in, in the operations. You know, all of these rely upon these uh, AI-based surrogate methods in order to bridge scales, which then let us be able to look from the generator all the way out to the grid and, and multiple years into the future. And with that, I'll, I'll just kind of briefly acknowledge that there's lots and lots of people doing this work across the, uh, several different uh, projects. And I think my 15 minutes are up. Thanks, David. Like I said, keep those questions coming. Yeah, I see a few rolling in in the chat. We really want to encourage that. Um, the last, but certainly not the speaker of this particular session, uh, is Don Parker. He's the principal engineer at Provecta Process Automation in Australia, uh, which he co-founded. And he previously served as president of a Chicago-based branch of Provecta. Um, and he was also employed by the State Electricity Authority in Australia 
Australia, where he specialized in design and optimization of power plant controls. Pretty relevant to this whole dialogue here today. Um, in his time with Provecta, he has provided specialist control engineering services to power generators throughout Australia, New Zealand, Asia, the UK, and the USA. Um, he provides practical assistance to US generating units to improve ramp rates, load range, and introduce automation enhancements. He also delivers simulation based training courses in boiler control design and optimization. He's the recipient of several engineering degrees and previously conducted research involving coal mill modeling, diagnostics, and control. Um, he is also the co-author of the second edition of the Thermal Power Plant Control and Instrumentation um, book, which has been published, and also several papers on advanced power plant controls and automation through ISA. So without further ado, Don, we welcome you to the floor. Kelly. So I want to take a, uh, a slightly different perspective, uh, perhaps a, a user's perspective of um, uh, looking at uh, intelligent control of power plants. How are we going to uh, uh, deploy and integrate these uh, these these um, capabilities? And so we're looking. I'm looking at opportunities and challenges, and I think what you'll find is that. Um, We'll be, I'll be picking up on some of the uh, opportunities people have already spoken of, and some of the um, some of the aspects of of uh, inter integrating those in, into the power plant. So basically, I'm looking from a power plant's perspective out into the uh, into the research area, into the uh, into the vendors, into the into the industry as a whole, and say, how am I going if I were a a plant owner or a fleet owner, how am I going to take uh, this these opportunities on board and make use of them and 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 get a benefit from them? So uh, so will the opportunities be taken up? Now, twenty five years ago, um, <clears throat> there was a knowledge based alarm system that at least Siemens was pro were, were producing a, a, a no a knowledge based operator support system. Um, which ended up being discontinued through lack of interest more than anything else, I think. Uh, we had an analog control uh, system at a power plant and we added on a digital add-on pack for advanced steam temperature control. Um, there was a digital advisor, a boiler optimizer, which was, <clears throat> which was uh, assisting operators in uh, mo modifying set points. The operators ended up refusing to use it because it was telling them to do things like uh, take furnace pressure to the, to a positive value, please, um, which of course was going to put ash and soot all over the power plant. So there were problems with it, uh, but there was already 25 years ago um, uh, quite a bit of work it, happening in this area and being deployed on power plant. Now, 20 years ago, I was involved in a, a plant uh, in in the state of Queensland and spent quite a few trips to Japan, uh, working with the German companies and Japanese companies, developing a single push button start supercritical coal plant with unattended operation where there was one operator for two units and he could leave the control room uh, with a pocket pager. Um, so the entire plant was operated with uh, one control room operator and one assistant uh, overnight. There were two people on the plant and uh, they could both leave the control room. Uh, it had a hot start facility to get to uh, um, from first fire to full load in two and a half hours. HP heaters were cut automatically in AGC. Uh, it achieved 12 alarms per 12 hour shift, um, but there was limited take up. There was a second plant that was built like that and, uh, and I think a third um, and some, some aspects of that high level of automation have been uh, taken up as part of um, brownfield uh, DCS upgrades, but a bit limited. And so we we thought, why why is it? Why hasn't this been universally picked up? Uh, the technology is there, and some of it is cost um, because you lo there's a lot of actuation needed, a lot of instrumentation needed, uh, lack of transparency. Something something that uh, Rick mentioned was actually a problem. 
because when you're um, doing a fast start on a plant, you may be starting a PA fan and a feed pump at the same time. And normally the operator needs to supervise those, but with single push button start, it just happens. And it decides uh, when the mills come in, for example, uh, when you change modes, when the bypass system closes off, it all just happens. The only decision that has to be made is to uh, when you want to start the plant up and, and to tell the um, system operator that you're about to synchronize onto the grid. Um, the other thing that happened, of course, was there were, were continued plant faults. Sensors didn't work. Actuators didn't work. And so uh, a lot of the single push button facility became really system system starts rather than uh, the entire system start, so subsystems. So we would start uh, an air and gas system. We'll start the feed, feed water system. Uh, we'll put all the drains on auto. But in terms of pushing a button and then coming back, uh, going and getting a coffee and coming back two and a half hours later, it didn't really happen that way. But now there's interest. There's new interest, I think, because of the digital transformation. There's new opportunities. And we have to ask, what are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the challenges? And how are we going to take them up? Um, how, how do you select uh, which of these opportunities are going to maximise the benefit for your plant? Um, how are we going to integrate them? How are we going to evaluate them? So I've got a suggested approach, and it's really just put out there so that we can discuss it. Um, it's, and, and you may uh, challenge what I'm saying, um, or you might like to take it up in a different way, or perhaps we can discuss aspects of it. But if you think about the hierarchy of functions, it's the sort of thing that ISA 95 discusses. You might say, well, at the bottom level, out in the field, we've got sensors and drives, and then they talk to the PLCs, DCSs, safety instrumented system, um, uh, you know, protection systems. And then above that, we've, there's the HMI historian, and diagnostics alarming, all in the operations centre at the operational level. And then there's a management level and a business level. And so that, that's just a hierarchy that I think evolves naturally out of good selection of control and monitoring equipment and the way you're going to operate the plant. It isn't something that you have to necessarily develop a philosophy of. Um, you don't need a philosophy of deciding to put sensors out in the field or drives out in the field. It just happens. And they talk to the PLC and that just happens or the DCS. So, but if you consider that hierarchy of functions, you may say, well, okay, I'm looking for a, a good um, AI app, um, just like going to my, um, uh, to my iPhone or my, <laughs> my Android and going to the store and picking out some app to help me sleep better or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and um, instead we choose a, an advanced alarming app and we decide to plug that into our plant, and it's now an AI system. Or we decide we, we want some improved diagnostics and we buy the product and we plug it into the system. But uh, I think this is, this is problematic if we, if we do this because we're not necessarily um, uh, maximizing the impact. Uh, we're not, we may in fact be disrupting things. Uh, I think what we need to do is um, look at um, really, really look at integration rather than plugging in or adding. So we need to integrate rather than add. And this is why uh, we've got to develop a roadmap. Not at, not only at, at the at, as we were speaking about at the every level, but at the local level. And so uh, think of that hierarchy of functions and now look at uh, a hierarchy of automation and, and how, it, how it looks. So a hierarchy of functions occur naturally, I think, or evolve naturally. Uh, whereas, you, when, whereas when you look at sequence automation, and sorry, this is a little hard to see, but over here on the left, um, I'll see if I can grab Got annotation. Um, shall I risk this? Uh, just trying to find a pointer. No, I won't risk it. <laughs> I'll end up putting labels everywhere. I think 
number four is unit level, number three is process level, and then we come down to the plant level or functions, right down to the bottom, which is modulating control and the drive level. So here we have a hierarchy of sequence automation. Now, um, that, is, that follows a design standard, a design philosophy, sorry, and an implementation standard. And when it's implemented, certain structured programming uh, techniques and principles have to be followed. You don't, you, what, otherwise you'll end up with what you might call spaghetti logic, uh, spaghetti and meatballs. And, um, and so you need a structured uh, arrangement to get sequence automation working uh, properly and well. And over on the right hand side, we have actually the, the actual implementation of that single push button start power plant in Queensland with a unit level sequence, and then process area sequences uh, groups, and they kicked off the, the various auxiliary sequences, and that was how it worked, and it was achieved. So this hierarchy doesn't happen naturally. This hierarchy requires design philosophy. It, it, does, it, does, uh, it requires standards, implementation standards, and it requires a structure in the design. So when we're thinking about AI systems, whether it's sequence automation, which was just an example, or whether it's modulating controls or uh, human factors in terms of operation, or whether it's um, how an alarm system is going to work, we have to think of it in terms of integrating within existing philosophies of operation rather than adding on as a feature or an app. So taking that same idea of a hierarchical approach, how can we build an intelligent framework uh, around, our, around a power plant? Well, I'm, I'm suggesting, and maybe this is not the best way, but my suggestion is we do it from the bottom up. And I do think that this is so, the sort of approach that Chet was talking about that um, Southern Company is, is taking. We start with smart devices first, um, and um, then uh, our controls, in functional areas how, as the vendors offer, and then with optimization and diagnostics. Now you might find that uh, people are, are finding the diagnostics is, is, is helpful at the beginning because it, it, it helps with uh, fault analysis. But um, when it comes to vendor applications, we need to integrate them into sequence and protection and alarm frameworks. We have to avoid an island islanded solutions uh, and so I've got a suggestion uh, here in the table, starting at the bottom um, uh, with field devices and we've got sensors and actuators. What are some of the features that you're looking for in sensors? Well, self-diagnosing, self-calibrating, perhaps intelligent communications and in-build an analytics. And then with actuators, they already, uh, you know, will, can detect their own faults. Um, they'll, they, they can recalibrate, but perhaps they should also be able to look at their own dynamics and optimize that for the process. In other words, embedded intelligence down at the field level. Then we move up to the controller level and I've separated them into modulating controls and sequential controls for convenience. But of course, sequ sequential controls must have the ability to be able to set set points and switch modes to activate and deactivate modulating controls. They have to, be, they have to talk together. And so sequential controls um, follow strict strict pathways, but uh, but if we have state-based systems, uh, if we if we build those, we can have adaptive alternative paths. We can provide time optimal um, sequential controls by having a, a a supervisory system that that looks at how the sequences are working and decides for itself where time can be saved by seeing how long it takes. You, you put a wait time in for uh, a vessel to fill or for a temperature to achieve something. There may be uh, opportunities to uh, move other, pro other parts of the processes more quickly so that you achieve those more, qu more quickly and then time is, uh, uh, can be shortened, for example. For modulating controls, and we've already talked a bit about this, um, uh, you could have, uh, for example, adaptive nonlinear model predictive control where the where the models are not necessarily um, built uh, 
by test by test procedures as uh, as you're as you're um, designing and tuning the model predictive control, but you have actually have an online system identifier so that we now have a fully adaptive, um, more robust um, model predictive control. And then up at the operations levels, you've got deployment um, uh, of, of the plant. So a load estimation with optimal plant configuration. So that's a plant economic model. And then a, a supervision, a, perhaps a meta controller that is deciding um, what set points, in other words, a lot, what loads to be operating plant at, um, what what temperature could, should you operate a plant at. If, if plant is stable for quite a long time, perhaps we can tweak up the, the steam temperature uh, set point. Uh, if, if we've got a context sensitive optimizer, we can actually do more around optimizing the plant than, than fixed set points. And then at, at the uh, top operations level, we've got analysis and diagnosis. Once again, root cause analysis um, with an intelligent um, analytics and prediction and digital twins. So there's some areas that uh, we could we could uh, apply AI, but within a framework um, that integrates with current practice and uh, the hierarchy of functions. So the other thing is that intelligent controls uh, may need safety constraints. And um, over on the left, we've got what I've called what we've called layers of protection. This is coming from one of the EPRI documents on building a, 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 a protection framework, particularly around sat uh, saturation protection on uh, heat recovery steam generators, uh, steam saturation protection. But it's a framework um, uh, with layers of protection where in the middle here we've got base modulating control and we're considering modulating control to be a, a first line of protection. And then um, we've got um, influences, basically nudging, uh, bumping and limiting, and then automatic overrides, uh, manual overrides, and then um, the last arrow on the left is taking you out of service and that's through trips. So what, what we're suggesting here is that we need um, as well as uh, over on the right, as well as a controller, um, an intelligent controller, and perhaps with an AI uh, system identifier, we've got to have a protection system that sits beyond the controller. And usually it just overrides the controller or nudges the controller, but the dotted line there is, is showing that limiting actions, lim limiting information may need to come back to your intelligent system. So that you can, um, so that it has some knowledge. So not only process inputs, but controller inputs, um, outputs, and limiting actions need to be fed into an intelligent system if it's going to integrate well. So um, the examples and opportunities uh, here. Well, already some examples, um, of course, uh, exist. Predictive analytics, um, performance optimization. Um, GE, for example, has already got. Uh, combustion optimizer. Uh, there, there are uh, several uh, boiler combustion and emission op optimization systems around. There have been soot blowing, uh, um, intelligent soot blowing systems, uh, water cannons. I've been involved in some uh, smart water cannon operation on uh, furnace walls for PRB type coal. Self tuning controllers, of course, have been around for a long time. And um, uh, image and inspection is is a new area I think that's going to be become quite important. But just looking at a couple of examples for flexible operations uh, for for boiler boiler operations, I've I've picked out two uh, relevant areas. Uh, one is uh, in boiler controls um, uh, that I've already mentioned that uh, in model predictive control. Uh, we've been working with uh, EPRI and, and Southern Company on advanced model predictive control down at their Barry plant as part of the DDF. And um, I think that we, we had some pr trouble with identification of the model and the sort of processes you have to go through to get the model identification. And, and uh, there's opportunity there to have an adaptive MPC where the model can be updated progressively can be learnt and updated. And in doing so, you would end up with a much more accurate model and 
and therefore you could improve the steam temperature control. But there's a, there are other applications as well, including a multi-variable uh, pressure megawatt and, and fuel overfiring uh, a controller, which could be either sitting on top of the existing coordinated control by modifying set points or actually replacing that system. So there's there's uh, good opportunities in boiler controls since it is so interactive, time varying, non-linear, and uh, multivariable. The other area is uh, thinking about uh, revisiting single push button start um, sequential operations for fast startups and overcoming some of the some of the difficulties that meant that we didn't have a, a strong take up in that area. And one is using adaptive state based sequences. Um, uh, having a system that learns some of the best options for starting up. Im improving actually transparency as Rick, Rick, Rick mentioned. But also building into these fast startups workarounds. It learns workarounds just the, the same way an operator would learn workarounds. So there I, th I think are some areas that could be picked up for flexible operations. Another area that I'm currently um, exploring as part of, a, as part of um, an EPRI project is, um, is problems with a primary frequency response um, in, in power plant. Now, this is a this is a critical area for um, grid security, and the reason is, uh, as renewables, uh, uh, more and more renewables are being integrated into the plant, uh, in into the grid. There's a smaller quantity of synchronous uh, rotating equipment that can provide either both inertial response, which was the initial. Um, uh, slowing down of the rotating uh, equipment to give up its kinetic energy to maintain balance once once some of the generation supply has been lost on the grid. And th that component and then the fast reaction of the existing plant that can that is synchronized to arrest the reduction in frequency. Now that low point uh, is shown at the top right hand um, curve, which is your frequency response curve. And that low point is the nadir. And that is a critical point that you have to, um, uh, that you have to address because if that goes too low, you, st you start load shedding. And so how do you recover the, the frequency? You do it by proportional action through, through frequency response. But generally, systems that, that model these responses assume a certain speed and, and quantity of response of availability at all times by the, plant, by the plant. But that's not the case. That, that reserve capability and the speed of that response varies with plant to plant, of course, and they can take that into account. But it varies from time to time, depending upon the current state of the plant. So I'm suggesting that um, with an intelligent estimator of frequency response, we can take into account all of the variables on the right hand side there, the mode, the load, limits, fuel, ambient uh, conditions, plant configuration, and come up with not just one number, the frequency reserve, which is what um, NERC requires at the moment. We, we can provide a six second reserve, a 30 second reserve, and a five minute reserve. Can it hold on for a full five minutes? Um, and so how do you, how are you going to use an uh, artificial intelligence to come up with this? Well, you can you test scenarios. You do it on a simulator, for example, the EPRI research simulator. We could do it on a drum boiler, on a once through boiler, on different types of plant, and then um, plant conditions um, uh, derive current the current dynamic reserve. And in other words, once you have run 50 scenarios through the plant simulator, it the system has learnt what all how the, those variables all interact. And so then it can come up with a fast, medium, and slow components. And that helps the balancing authority and the and the uh, transmission system operator to get better real-time estimate of the current reserve and therefore help keep the grid secure. Now one of the advantages of the EPRI research simulator that's been recently um, 
completed is that we can ch we can change the models and also we because it's got access to advanced uh, control like uh, for example all the MATLAB toolboxes um, we can build neural networks and look at multivariable controls as well so um, so that's some examples and I think that's uh, oh sorry and I do have one more slide uh, and so the suggested approach is to review your base automation philosophy to integrate the applications don't do add-ons integrate them in, and that means integrate into the HMI, the alarms, the philosophy operation. Choose carefully. Make sure that the apps you're looking for, because they're not really apps, are beneficial, deployable, maintainable, and you get buy-in from all the stakeholders. Go through an assessment process and then design it well. Make sure that the, that the application itself is designed well, that in fact it's fault tolerant, um, but consider the human factors. Make sure it's robust and it, and make sure you put the protective layers or the layers of protection in around that system so it's properly integrated and that completes my my talk thanks thanks don yes yeah, so let's let's uh give our uh presenters a round of applause here for getting it done we do have some passionate presenters here uh and we knew that that would be coming but um thank you so much everyone for for sticking around and the other thing i want to be appreciative of is that um there were several questions that were put up on the fly and answered on the fly so that was great so um that made it a little easier i know we're sitting at 534 um I, I do I do want to be respectful of people's time. I mean, we can answer a couple questions, but after that, we probably need to to sign off. Um, but yeah, I, I like I said, I saw many of them from Chet that were were able to be um, done on the fly. The one I did want to um, address on my own was it says you know. Uh, I'm trying to see where it was. It says looking for coordinating controls with M and D. And Chet said that they're not there yet. Um, but I will say that this is being um, actively pursued at EPRI through several activities. We actually just talked about it yesterday during our advisory session. Um, the one thing I'd like to ask, I mean, Rick, is that something that you guys are looking at doing at Emerson as well through your control systems? Rick Kephart, sorry, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Steve, I was double muted there. Um, yes, actually, Steve, that, that is something that we've been, been thinking about. You know, we, we, we don't really have a formal program there, but that's, a, that's definitely an area of interest. Okay, yeah, and like I said, that's definitely something we're starting to look at through supervisory control at EPRI as well on some smaller scale units and some smaller scale uh, components. Hey Steve, uh, I, I just wanted to add a, a few more things. So um, we are, uh, we have remote operating centers or we are working on having remote operating sensors for things like renewables and hydro plants, uh, but for fossil and nuclear, we're, st we're still operating the plants uh, at the plant. So, uh, so we have a hybrid. So um, for simple systems like renewables, like solar, wind and uh, hydro, we are looking at remote operating centers. Perfect. I'm trying to th see, uh, Kelly, did you see any other ones that were unaddressed on the fly? I think we talked about the NVIDIA experience on AI applied to boiler optimization from Jaleel. Yeah, and I, there was one question that, that popped up. I started to address it, but I'd be curious if any of our panelists have additional information. Um, there was a question about what's the best way of getting employed in the energy industry using AI? Um, I have put some items in the chat, but I would love to hear from, from others on the panel if they have any comments. I was coming from the perspective that, you know, you're an already an SME. And there's just so many resources out there for both free online as well as more formalized accreditation opportunities to add AI into your your wheelhouse. So those were what I put in the chat. Um, doesn't sound like anybody else has more to add to that one. I think we yeah we addressed the the health index. Yeah. Said kudos to the to the um. 
panel for, for addressing those on the fly. And once again, apologies that we ran over. We just have a passionate group of folks in here, and we were – as you can tell, there's lots going on in this area, and that's only five of us, and there was about 45 people on the call, so I'm sure everyone could have done a good bit of it. But, um, yeah, we're like I said, we're sitting at 537, um, and so I'd, I'd like to say, you know, once again, I, I appreciate everyone coming in for the, for the talk. Um, if there's any other um, questions, you know, like I said, pre feel free to bring them out. We'll make sure to address them offline. Um, and we will, I'll look into providing the presentations following the call as well. So um, with that, like I said, uh, apologies that the Q&A was cut short, but much appreciated on everyone's time. Um, and you, like I said, very awesome perspectives that we were able to provide through this panel. So thank you so much. Um, I think we'll we'll call it a day and um, look forward to um, some more working group meetings in the future. We'll start scheduling those shortly, and uh, we'll get you on the guest list. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone. Thanks, Steve. Great, great work. Great panel. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.